Hi, my name is Tiffany Walker, and I'm an OBGYN here at Holy Cross Hospital. I'm also the Vice Chair of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and an affiliate professor at the University of Miami Internal Medicine Residency Program, where I teach the residents women's health. So today I'm gonna to talk with you guys about a pretty important topic um, as it pertains to OBGYN, which is prenatal care. So finding out you're pregnant is very exciting news for most women. Um, after you do the multiple pregnancy tests, the next question that most women have is, what do I do next? So it's often followed by questions about what to expect and what comes next after you find out that you're pregnant. So whether you're a first time mom or you have multiple children, seeking prenatal care early on in the pregnancy is key to having a healthy pregnancy for you and for your baby. So the question is, what is prenatal care? So prenatal care is the health care that women receive while they're pregnant. It includes a span of office visits that start typically from the first trimester of pregnancy up until the postpartum uh, care. So the goal of prenatal care is basically to minimize morbidity and mortality for both the mom and for the fetus and to maximize the chance for a safe and a healthy delivery. So current statistics um, about prenatal care. Uh, first of all, women who don't receive prenatal care typically are seven times more likely to have premature births. They're also five times more likely to have a fetal demise, um, as well as being three times more likely to give birth to an infant that has a low birth weight. Infants who have low birth weight um, are more likely to have other medical problems um, in their lifetime, such as language delays, attention deficit disorder, as well as other severe neurological problems. So a, good, a lot of question that, um, or a common question that women typically ask me is when should I initiate care? So prenatal care is often initiated ideally from eight to 12 weeks after the last menstrual period. For pregnancies that do not have any complications, prenatal visits are usually uh, the first uh, up to 28 weeks for every four weeks, from 28 weeks to 36 weeks every two weeks, and then from 36 weeks up until delivery every week after that. The schedule can change depending on if a woman has any other medical problems or any other medical comorbidities, such as chronic hypertension, diabetes, thyroid disease. So it really depends on uh, a woman's medical history about how often that they're seen throughout the pregnancy. So at the first prenatal visit, uh, which is typically the mo a very important visit, there's a lot of things that are get, get done at that first prenatal visit. So first off in my practice, I do a very detailed medical history with the patient. So I basically want to know everything about the patient. I want to know if she has any medical problems. Has she had um, high blood pressure in the past? Any issues with diabetes? Um, I also want to know her past surgical history because that's very important to know. Um, we also need to know about any medications a patient is on, whether or not she has any allergies to any medications. Um, and a lot of other things that you think is pertinent that your doctor should know should be discussed at that first prenatal care visit. Another thing that we do at that first visit is a physical examination. So if a woman has not had a pap test um, within the last few years, then that's typically a one thing that we do at the first prenatal visit. A pap test is, to, is for cervical cancer screening. We'll also do a breast exam if a breast exam is warranted. Um, we do STD screening at the first prenatal care visit for common STDs like gonorrhea, chlamydia, trichomonas. Also at that first prenatal visit, if a woman has not had an ultrasound yet to date her pregnancy, we do a uh, dating ultrasound to make sure that the fetus is inside of the uterus, to tell how many fetuses there are in the pregnancy, as well as to detail the uterus and ovaries. 
Another thing that's done um, at the first prenatal visit is lab testing. So with lab testing, uh, there's a certain subset of labs that typically every OBGYN um, practice will uh, do at the first prenatal visit. In my practice, we check for a patient's blood count to tell whether or not she's anemic. We look for other um, sexually transmitted diseases such as HIV, hepatitis B and C, as well as syphilis. We look for um, a patient status if they're rubella immune. Um, and there are other labs that uh, certain OBGYNs will do and may not do um, as it pertains to their practice. Another thing that we may do is some genetic testing um, with the patient at the first prenatal visit, depending on how far along she is. So another very important thing that's done at that first visit is counseling and education. So women typically have a good number of questions about what foods they can eat in pregnancy, whether or not they can exercise, and whether or not they can travel. So I go over a detailed account of you know, different types of foods that a woman should avoid or can eat in pregnancy, such as decreasing your caffeine intake, um, increasing your water intake in pregnancy, which is very important to increase hydration. So typically we recommend at least eight glasses of water per day. We also talk about foods that you want to avoid during the pregnancy, such as any raw meat, sushi, um, unpasteurized cheeses, uh, cold cut meats or certain dairy products that you don't want to consume during the pregnancy. Travel is also a, a very important thing um, that patients typically ask me about. I mean, now that we're in um, you know, the era of COVID-19, we haven't had many pregnant women traveling, but um, outside of that, you know, travel is pretty important. Uh, I typically tell my patients that travel after 32 weeks of pregnancy by plane is not recommended. Um, but in a normal, healthy pregnancy, <clears throat> most pregnant women can travel up until that time. So, you know, you just want to make sure that, you know, you give patients precautions and counsel them on what is um, recommended and not recommended. So at subsequent prenatal care visits, um, there are a number of things that we do pretty routine or standard throughout an, the entire pregnancy. So at every prenatal visit, I do a history and physical exam just to make sure there's nothing new um, that has occurred since the last prenatal visit. I ask every pregnant woman about pain in pregnancy, whether or not they're having bleeding, um, if they're feeling their fetus move around. So just a generalized, you know, how are you doing um, with every subsequent visit. Genetic testing is also offered um, to patients uh, throughout the pregnancy. Um, and depending on their gestational age will depend on whether or not they can have genetic testing done at that prenatal visit. We also do measurement of vital signs at every prenatal care visit. So checking a blood pressure is very important as well as a woman's weight and heart rate and temperature. The weight gives you a generalized idea of whether or not a woman is gaining too much weight or too little weight in the pregnancy, which both can be associated with bad outcomes. For instance, women who gain too much weight in the pregnancy may be at a higher risk for gestational diabetes or large for gestational age infant versus a woman who gains too little weight in the pregnancy may be at a risk of a low birth weight uh, fetus. So a urinalysis is also done at every prenatal visit. And I often get questions uh, from my moms asking me, well, how come I have to leave a urine every time I come to the doctor's office? And a urinalysis, although it's such a simple test, can give you so much information about the well-being of your pregnancy. For instance, with the urinalysis, we check for protein in the urine every visit. We also look for any signs of infections, if it's urinary tract infection. Uh, we're also looking for any glucose in the urine, which can be a sign of gestational diabetes. Um, we can also even check to see whether or not you're drinking enough water in your pregnancy because ketones is another thing that um, is checked on the urinalysis. And if that urine is very high in ketones, we can tell whether or not you're dehydrated or not. So again, checking a urine can give you so much information about the well-being of your pregnancy, which is why it's done at every prenatal care visit. We also assess the, uh, the growing fetus. 
So in my practice, after 20 weeks gestation, I measure what we call a fundal height. So the fundal height basically is a measurement, um, which I use a tape measurer, from the pubic symphysis up to the fundus of the uterus, which is basically the top of the uterus. And it basically will measure um, you know, your gestational age. For example, if you're 28 weeks pregnant, your fundal height should be measuring 28 centimeters, give or take one or two centimeters. And that gives me a generalized idea of whether the fetus is growing appropriately. And then at every prenatal visit, I always answer questions and concerns that moms have. I always tell my pregnant moms to write down their questions because pregnancy brain is real and women will commonly forget the questions that you know they you know thought so hard about you know prior to the visit and then they can't remember a thing uh, once the prenatal visit has started so i definitely you know recommend that you know if you're uh, getting prenatal care every visit you know write down a certain subset of questions for your OBGYN so that you don't forget and that you make sure that all your questions are answered so ultrasound, um, as we talked a little bit about, is very important in the pregnancy. Um, the first ultrasound, like I said, is typically done at the beginning of the pregnancy to date the pregnancy and make sure that the pregnancy is inside of the uterus. Um, we also um, use ultrasound to identify the number of fetuses inside of the uterus, whether this is a twin pregnancy or a triplet pregnancy. Um, ultrasound can also be used to screen for any kind of genetic conditions or any congenital abnormalities. Um, we also use ultrasound to check for any placenta prob problems to see if the placenta is in the proper location and make sure that the placenta is healthy. So the second trimester is from 13 weeks on to 28 weeks gestation. The second trimester probably is considered uh, the happiest time in the pregnancy. That's when most women get to feeling like their overall normal self again. Um, typically the nausea, vomiting um, subsides in the second trimester and most women will you know, feel much better and get their energy back in the second trimester. So in the second trimester, again, we do genetic testing. So typically the genetic test that we do in the second trimester is called the alpha fetoprotein. And that one is basically checking for any neurological or disorders or what we call neural tube defects. So what's important to note is that genetic testing in pregnancy is not necessarily required, but it's highly recommended. Um, and what we typically are looking for is um, any fetus that's at high risk of Down syndrome, trisomy 13, trisomy 18, and other sex chromosomal disorders, as well as any kind of neural tube defects. Also, what's done in the second trimester is a detailed anatomy scan. So around 18 to 20 weeks, we do an anatomy scan, which basically looks for you know, looks at all of the organs in the developing fetus, make sure everything is developing appropriately. Um, we also can look at the sex of the baby um, with the anatomy ultrasound and just basically make sure baby has 10 fingers and 10 toes. Now, while the anatomy ultrasound does give you a very detailed, um, you know, scan of the baby, it does not always pick up every, you know, little detail or every abnormality that can be, um, that can happen in a pregnancy. So that's definitely something that I counsel my patients on. Also in the second trimester, we do gestational diabetes screening. So gestational diabetes screening is typically done around 24 to 26 weeks. And it's where um, a woman drinks a really um, sweet drink or what we call a sugar load. And then an hour later, we check her blood sugar um, to look to see how um, high her or how low her blood sugars is. So again, it's just a screening test. And I also always let my patients know that even if the test does come back positive, it does not necessarily mean there's something wrong, but that you may be at a higher risk. So we also do anemia screening in the second trimester. So in my practice, I recheck um, a patient's blood counts in the second trimester, as well as repeat an HIV test, a hepatitis test, and a syphilis test. So the third trimester is from 28 weeks to delivery. So this third trimester is probably um, 
from the um, the first trimester to the third trimester is probably one of the most important trimesters. Um, and that's because, you know, there are a lot of conditions that typically will arise in the third trimester. So in the third trimester, we typically will do a vaccine called the Tdap or tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. So that vaccination um, is given after 28 weeks because it actually provides immunity to the fetus. So uh, most neonates do not get their vac first set of vaccinations until two months after they're born. So that vaccine basically gives antibodies to the growing fetus, which it passes the placenta and gives those antibodies to them so it protects them up until their two month visit. We also do a growth ultrasound in my practice in the third trimester. For me, um, even though I do measure the fundal height at every prenatal care visit, a growth ultrasound in the third trimester just gives me a general um, sense of fetal well-being and just making sure that the fetus is growing appropriately. We also check to see if the fetus is head down, which by that town, by that time, uh, most fetuses are um, head down, you know, in the ready position for birth. Um, and we check the fluid level and we just check a weight on the baby. GBS testing is also done in the third trimester. GBS is also known as group B strep. So group B strep is a normal bacteria that lives in the vagina, but if you're positive for it, then when you're in labor, we can treat you with antibiotics. So I do have a question here. Why is the Tdap given during pregnancy, but not after birth? So the question is, why is Tdap, the vaccine, given in pregnancy but not after birth? So actually, it can be given at both times. So we, it's recommended to give the Tdap in pregnancy because it actually gives antibodies to the fetus while the fetus is in utero. So those, once you give the vaccination to the mom, those antibodies can actually pass from the mother's blood through the placenta to the baby, and it provides immunity to the baby once the baby is born. Because if you remember, a, a neonate does not get their first set of vaccinations until they're two months. So from that birth till two months, they're unprotected. So when you give the Tdap vaccine in utero, you're actually protecting your baby. Now you can actually give Tdap after um, delivery as well to moms. However, it's really um, just protecting mom from getting um, pertussis, which is whooping cough, and not spreading it to her baby. What's also important to note, which I didn't mention, is that um, anyone who's gonna be around the baby, such as the father, grandparents, or grandma, grandfather, um, any aunts and uncles that are gonna be in close contact with the baby should also get the Tdap vaccination as well. So uh, I think we were talking about uh, group B strep. So group B strep is a normal bacteria that lives in the vagina. If you're positive for it, then when you're in labor, we treat you with antibiotics because sometimes it can make babies sick. So we do a, just a general swab of the vaginal and anal genital area, and that's typically done around 35 to 36 weeks. And GBS is very important because in infants who do um, actually get the disease or GBS bacteremia can get very sick from it. It can cause pneumonia and it can even cause encephalitis. So another thing that's recommended in the third trimester is that moms do what we call fetal kick counts. So fetal kick counts are basically where you monitor how much the baby is moving around. So on average, your baby should be moving around at least 10 times every hour to two hours. If you're noticing that the movements um, have slowed down or you're not noticing those 10 times, then the first thing that we recommend is, you know, drinking some cold juice or taking like a cold shower. But sometimes babies do go through sleep cycles which sleep cycles can last for up to 45 minutes to an hour, where you may not feel the baby moving around as much. And if you still are not feeling the baby move around, then that's when we recommend that you go, you know, call your doctor or go to labor and delivery to be evaluated. So another important thing that we talk about in the third trimester is birthing classes, prenatal classes, breastfeeding, as well as doing hospital tours. 
So prior to COVID-19 here at Holy Cross, we gave hospital tours every week to our pregnant moms and dads, as well as grandparents, whoever wanted to come um, on the hospital tour could come. And basically um, we had a nurse that showed them around the labor and delivery unit, as well as showed them the postpartum unit, just for them to get a general sense of what to expect when they came in labor. So this is um, especially important for first time moms because going into labor and not knowing where to go or what to expect can be very scary. So the hospital tours definitely gave moms um, a general sense of being at ease if they knew what to expect. So I do recommend that my pregnant patients do prenatal classes. Uh, we do offer prenatal classes here at Holy Cross. Um, we've uh, recently started back up our prenatal classes um, since the pandemic started, and uh, we're also um, offering virtual prenatal classes. I do feel like prenatal classes are very beneficial, again, especially to first-time parents or even to you know moms who've had multiple children if they haven't you know if they have older children and are starting over again. The prenatal class classes that we offer here are um, breastfeeding class. We also offer a class on what to expect um, during the labor process. And then we offer a class on everything to expect during the postpartum period. So if you're ever wanting to sign up for classes, um, I talk with my patients about it and they go on the Holy Cross website and they can sign up for the classes. So breastfeeding is very important um, to us here at Holy Cross. Um, Holy Cross Hospital is the only designated uh, what we call baby friendly hospital in Broward County and the baby friendly hospital initiative basically is a global program that was used to encourage the implementation of what we call the 10 steps to successful breastfeeding. So baby friendly hospitals um, give mothers the information, the confidence, and the skills that are necessary to initiate and to continue breastfeeding their infants, you know, throughout the postpartum period. And um, the baby friendly hospital initiative basically is a prestigious recognition that is given to hospitals that have successfully completed the 10 steps to um, successful breastfeeding. So we definitely promote breastfeeding here at Holy Cross. In my practice, we even have our nurses around 32 to 34 weeks talk with um, all moms that are interested in breastfeeding um, about the benefits of breastfeeding, as well as you know giving them more information and guidance on uh, what they need, need to be successful at breastfeeding. And now in cases where there's a medical indication or if a mom has made an informed decision that she wants to use formula, um, baby friendly also means that we help moms with the safe preparation and feeding of formula. So you shouldn't feel like um, you know breastfeeding is the only way because um, we do help moms that want to formula feed. So we do have um, a question. When should Rogam be administered? So Rogam um, is basically a, um, an antibody that is given to moms who are what we call RH negative. So it depends on your blood type, whether or not you're going to need Rogam or not in the pregnancy. Now, if you have a blood type, for instance, that's like B negative or O negative, then that's when you get Rogam. And you typically get Rogam at 28 weeks gestation. And second question, how do I wean my two-year-old? He basically uses me as a pacifier to fall asleep. So the question is, how do I wean my two-year-old? And I'm guessing from breastfeeding. Um, so it, it's very difficult um, to wean kids off of um, breastfeeding. Um, I myself have breastfed two children and uh, weaning them off of breastfeeding is not an easy task. Um, one of the you know, best things to do with weaning a child off of breastfeeding is to kind of get into a routine um, and maybe
maybe giving an alternative to breastfeeding, um, especially at nighttime. So for instance, um, you know, maybe if the child, you know, is having difficulty falling asleep and they want to breastfeed, you may want to give them, you know, something that would help comfort them. So if they're using the breast as just a tool to comfort, maybe giving them like a blanket or, you know, a stuffed animal to help with um, uh, weaning them off will help. Because that's what most, um, especially if they're two and they're still breastfeeding, they really just want to be comforted. Um, so you have to find an alternative um, to, the, to the breast, basically. And, you know, one of the things which was, you know, for me, um, my daughter used a pacifier, you know, until she was two. And the thing that helped me kind of wean her off of a pacifier was giving her, again, another alternative. So a blanket to sleep with, um, you know, at nighttime instead of the pacifier. And for us, you know, meaning for moms, um, you know, those, the breast or the pacifier, honestly, is more for us than it is for the child. Um, so the best thing to do, honestly, would just be to take it away. And most often, you know, kids will adapt. You know, they're, you, you, we think that they won't be able to, but they definitely adapt um, very easily. I hope that answers the question. All right. So the last thing that I wanted to talk um, a little bit about was the postpartum care and the postpartum period. So prenatal care extends into the postpartum period. Um, and sometimes the postpartum period is actually referred to as the fourth trimester. So postpartum is from delivery to six weeks after the delivery. Um, you know, postpartum is very important because actually there are a lot of conditions or, you know, complications that can happen in the postpartum period um, that's actually more common to the postpartum period than even during the pregnancy. For instance, postpartum preeclampsia is something that um, women get actually after the pregnancy versus during pregnancy, as well as, um, you know, blood clots or DVTs are actually in some studies more common in the postpartum period versus in uh, during the pregnancy. So it's very important um, for you to monitor um, and continue to see your OBGYN during the postpartum period um, as well as during the pregnancy itself. So understanding the changes that happen to your body during the postpartum period is very important. Um, because, you know, swelling can increase in the postpartum period, contractions can even continue in the postpartum period, especially for moms who are breastfeeding. So if you know and understand those changes, um, then you will be able to figure out if there's um, any complication going on. So looking out for signs of postpartum related conditions is very important. For instance, headaches or blurry vision, um, shortness of breath or chest pain can be an indication of postpartum preeclampsia. Increased swelling in your lower extremities can be a sign of a blood clot or um, DVT in the legs. Um, thyroid disease is another thing that can happen in the postpartum period known as postpartum thyroiditis. So we definitely um, monitor women more closely who have risk factors for those diseases. And another thing that is very important in the postpartum period is the mental health. Um, postpartum depression um, can occur um, to one in seven to one in 10 women um, after pregnancy. And it's very important that you look out for signs of postpartum depression. Um, the reason why women get postpartum depression can be any number of things from the changes in their hormones um, to the overall sleep deprivation that happens um, to exhaustion or just generalized feeling of being overwhelmed, especially for first time moms or even more so for um, moms who have multiple children and getting adapting to having a new child and yet still having to take care of their younger children as well. 
So depression or postpartum depression typically occurs um, one to two weeks after a pregnancy, and typically um, the onset is within four weeks after a delivery. Um, some symptoms that you may notice is difficulty sleeping, um, appetite changes, excessive fatigue, um, frequent mood changes, which some uh, women may just attribute those changes to the fact that they have a newborn and not even realize that they have postpartum depression. That's why in my practice, it's very important um, for me to make sure that, especially for women who are at higher risk of postpartum depression, that I'm seeing them more frequently and asking them you know, questions about postpartum depression. So some other things that you may experience um, for women who have postpartum depression is a loss of pleasure, um, a feeling of worthlessness, a feeling of helplessness. So one of the common questions that I ask um, my postpartum moms is, in the past two weeks, have you often been bothered by feelings of being down, depressed, or hopeless? And um, if the answer is yes, then you may you know, be suffering from postpartum depression. The good thing about you know, postpartum depression is that it is you know, typically treatable. Um, for most moms, uh, just generalized therapy as well as you know, more regular postpartum visits can help them a lot with postpartum depression. Um, for some moms who um, may have history of depression in the past, or maybe having a more severe case of postpartum depression, then anti-anxiety or antidepressant medications um, can be introduced as along with um, the therapy. And what um, research studies have found to be even more beneficial to women is actually participating in support groups um, or emotional support groups um, for women who have had the same problems or the same issues or women who are in their postpartum period as well and are suffering from postpartum depression as well. Um, so for moms uh, who are having postpartum depression, they know that they're not the only ones out there um, and that it is a very common disorder um, and that there is support for them. So even um, joining a Facebook group or you know joining a local um, you know, YMCA group for breastfeeding moms or, you know, moms that, you know, are in the same um, category as you can really help with that. And there also um, is a new FDA approved medication um, for women who have severe postpartum depression. And it's actually um, an IV infusion medication, which um, thankfully I have not had um, to use on any of my patients, but that definitely is an option for women who have you know, very severe postpartum depression. So um, that is the end of uh, my presentation. Um, I hope you learned a lot about prenatal care and about the postpartum care. Um, and if you have any you know, specific questions, then you can definitely log on to the Facebook um, you know, chat and uh, ask us um, any questions and we can definitely answer them for you.